crisis in the People's Democratic Party as seven members of the National Working Committee resign. PDP governors call emergency meeting to discuss the issues. Lawyer Femi Falana seeks clarification over the non-trial of 400 suspected members of Boko Haram three months after the arrest. And also uh, a review of today's papers and much more coming your way this morning on The Breakfast. And with that, we say good morning and welcome to the midweek edition of The Breakfast here on Plus TV Africa. Beautiful Wednesday morning. I hope that you've gotten enough rest and you're ready for the tasks and challenges for today. I am Osaogi Ogbonwa. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. I am Aneta Felix. And good morning, Osaogi. Morning to you. Wow, quite an interesting start to a Wednesday morning. First of all, our top trending story, we're beginning with a picture that seems to have gone viral. Um, it's of a Nigerian soldier that is sleeping on a mattress um, that is hinged on tree branches. And uh, another soldier there seeming to be attending to him. Um, the picture didn't come with a caption to explain what exactly is happening. So we don't have an idea if that's a blood transfusion from one soldier to the other, if it's Whatever it is, we have no idea what that picture is saying and what exactly is, you know, being done uh, in terms of treatment for the soldier. But I think the focus here is on the environment, right? The state of welfare of Nigerian soldiers. This is something we've talked about for a while. We've had soldiers um, sneak out videos of themselves talking about the challenges they're facing on the war front, how many of, you know, their colleagues are dying, you know, releasing videos saying these terrorists are coming with arms and ammunition that are so sophisticated and they don't have, you know, anything to match that up. And the colleagues of theirs die on the field. Colleagues of theirs, you know, face so many health challenges, but help doesn't seem to be coming in from anywhere. They get very little food and they have to ration. So it makes you wonder if this is a soldier that has been sent to the war front to battle terrorists who are funded by multi-billionaires, according to one of the topics we'll be talking about later today. What chance do we have to fight terrorism in the country? Well, we, we've, um, you know, multiple times we've spoken about the issues with uh, funding for, you know, our, our security agencies. And, you know, uh, you know, I've always mentioned, you know, that there is ov obviously a challenge with auditing, you know, where these billions go to, the billions that are budgeted every year, you know, if it is simply just to pay the salaries of these soldiers, which of course are still um, not enough, you know, or, you know, to buy equipment. And you know, if it is to buy equipment, you know, how come they're not getting enough, you know, for not just, you know, um, you know, ammunition now, but also for medical equipment, um, you know, clothing, you know, stuff that they might use in the battle um, uh, field and all of that. Um, there's still no major questions being asked as to what really happens to all the billions that is budgeted every year uh, for the Nigerian military and for the Nigerian police, who still will tell you that they don't have money for petrol uh, before they, you know, attend to your security challenges, who would still ask you to buy airtime in their phones, who will still, of course, collect bribe from you, you know, to carry out. I read someone, someone who said, he had um, a 270,000 naira case, you know, that uh, someone had uh, was owing him. He called the police, you know, he had approached the police and reported, and they asked him for 300,000 uh, to be able to, you know, pursue that case. Um, but that's for the police. For the army, it's pretty much the same thing, you know. And every now and then, you mentioned there's uh, one video or the other where they are complaining about, you know, poor funding and you know lack of resources to be able to actually carry out the war against insurgency and to be somehow, some way. Um, you know, have all the things that they need in the battlefront. Um, but, you know, for the picture that we just showed, you know, I, I, I've seen that, you know, and it seems like, you know, there's an intravenous uh, uh, connected to the, uh, the soldier who was lying down. Uh, doesn't look like a blood transfusion because it seems there's something hanging on the, on the tree, um, wherever that is. Um, you know, and I would simply also say that I think, you know, in, in the battlefront, not everything, there's, no go there's not going to be world-class hospitals waiting for you there. And so it is also part of the training that soldiers have to be able to treat themselves at emergency situations before 
help comes. In other climates, maybe there will be a helicopter to move the soldier to a proper hospital, uh, to a military hospital. Maybe there would be, you know, um, you know, a, a military hospital somewhere close by where uh, soldiers like this can be moved to when they fall ill or when they're hit uh, by uh, bullets or, or whatnot. Um, but it, for me, I'm, I'm seeing this as um you know soldier you know making do with what he ha he has in the battlefront where there isn't necessarily the very best medical care um it's part of their training it's part of the things that they will have to deal with in order to survive they have some of the you know best survival uh, tactics um and that's part of their training you know if you are going to be a soldier um if you fall ill in the battlefront you know no one is expecting that you would immediately be moved to luth or to any hospital, you know, close by. You would have to be, you know, on the battlefield and get stronger right there until there's better medical care uh, provided for you. But, you know, the question is, will there be better medical care provided for these soldiers or not? Um, and so we can't really uh, judge 100% from what this picture is saying. Um, I would simply just say that, you know, there's, we, there will be, you know, questions, you know, that we will continue to ask concerning funding and auditing of the funds that have been provided for the military and for security agencies every year in the national budget and also commending this you know brave soldier who of course is uh, being able to work under the toughest conditions you know while bullets are flying left and right still is able to set up uh, an iv uh, fluid and also treat his uh, fellow soldier yes indeed um the fact that we lack clarity as to what's happening in that picture you know is something that really bothers me because we need the facts to really tell the story. But we also don't know because we know that usually medical troops should accompany them, people trained to be able to treat people yeah, and give them immediately them. Um, you know, first aid. So why the challenge, why there's a challenge with that, the fact that there was no caption because we don't know if that soldier that we see treating that man or the other soldier lying on the bed is part of you know, those medical troops. But the fact remains that you know, it's glaring and almost you know, saddening to see that as a Nigerian, someone who's on the front lines trying to make sure that we all are safe is, you know, receives that kind of treatment, so poor and just inadequate. Anyway, I'm oh. um, still talking about terrorism. We know that in the first week of May, um, the federal government announced that they had arrested um, about 400 suspected terrorism financiers and that these were um, primarily owners of uh, the Bureau de Change and that um, they were going to immediately begin prosecution. Um, three months later, we're here to see anything about that. We're here to get updates, even though they had said that, you know, there was a Jusen strike, Judiciary Staff Union, and that after the strike, they were going to begin prosecution. But the strike is long over. We're not hearing anything from them yet. Then there was a report by Sahara Reporters. We can't independently verify, um, you know, the claims made in that report, but it went into points accusing fingers at Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, saying that Malami had basically tried to stop the raid of those terrorism financiers, had collected money from them and had freed them, you know, saying that he just didn't want the names of those terrorism financiers to be revealed. Again, these are unconfirmed reports by Sahara Reporters. But um, the big story is that yesterday, August um, 2nd, August 2nd on Tuesday, um, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Femi Falano, um, sent an FOI request, a Freedom of Information request, to um, Malami, asking him to immediately you know, provide details about these terrorists that were arrested and why prosecution is stalling. He's giving them seven days, you know, according to FOI rules, um, to make sure that we're, we know exactly where we stand regarding these people. Because it's something the government keeps saying, we know who the terrorists are, we know who their sponsors are, we're going to publish names, and then months and months later, um, it seems that story is dead. Yeah, um, so for the third time, uh, we, we can't verify the allegations made by Sahara reporters. Um, um, there is no actual proof of anything, you know, so far, you know, so those are really just, uh, that's really just a story on Sahara reporters uh, that has, you know, no actual verification yet. Um, so starting with that, I would also say that you know, we've, you know, I personally have always believed that if we were sincere with our fight against insurgency, um, there are, you know, two things that were very important, you know, that we should have done, you know, and one of them was being able to find out and arrest people who, three things, arrest people who, you know, were the source of the funding for these uh, terrorists. Uh, they don't, you know, have any other way of making money except through either kidnapping 
or financial support from whoever it is that is behind them. It doesn't matter who they are. It could be people from outside the country even. But, you know, there is a follow, follow the money, basically. It's a money trail that you can follow and you will be able to find out um, who is sponsoring this, um, these terrorists. And when you cut off the funding, it's one of, ways, one of the ways to weaken these insurgents. Um, in every single way. Another thing was, of course, uh, you know, being able to show prosecution for arrested terrorists, you know, for both their financiers and, you know, those who have been arrested um, or caught in the act of terrorism. Uh, they should be charged to court and they should be, you know, uh, sentenced, you know, if found guilty. Um, for the last 10 years, we've not been able to see any actual Boko Haram or bandit or insurgent or UG um, or, or gone known men or whatever they are called. Uh, who have been charged to court and sentenced uh, for these crimes in 10 years. Um, the final one would be, you know, how much work we've done with regards to our borders. Um, where do these weapons come in from? Uh, they are not manufactured here in Nigeria, and so they have to be coming in through somewhere. And it means that there's somebody who's letting them into the country somehow, some way. There's definitely a person who turns his, uh, you know, turns his face the other way when these weapons are being brought into Nigeria. Um, so those are the three things that I've always mentioned. But of course, it has to do a lot with political will. And it's great that we had a conversation yesterday with um, um, Getso, the guy we interviewed yesterday, who said a lot, you know, with regards to the fight against insurgency and banditry. Um, with regards to their financing, there's no way, there's absolutely no way that the Nigerian government would say that in 10 years, they've not been able to follow 1,000 Naira and find out the source of the 1,000 Naira that went to a bandit or went to a terrorist. There's absolutely no way. It, 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 you, you can't tell that to a three-year-old and he or she would believe you. There's no way that the Nigerian government would boast and say that in 10 years, we've started this fight since, what, 2009 or 2010? In 10 years, we've not been able to follow five, two dirty 500 Naira notes that went to a bandit or Boko Haram or well, But that's what they said in May, that they know who is well, providing it, the money. The well, challenge on, until, is, let us know exactly, because they've been saying that they were going to prosecute until and name and shame Until we this get game. there. So that's why I put those three things together. Until we get to that place where they actually show these names, then I'm going to assume that we don't know. And then I go, the government is claiming that they still don't know if they've uh, so, you know, supposedly arrested 400 people and they've not been able to tell the Nigerian people who these people are, they've not been able to prosecute or send them to court, you know, and, and you know, go through the whole process, then I'm going to continue to assume that we don't know. In 10 years, the Nigerian government cannot in any way say that they are not aware of, they've not been able to arrest five people, one person, 10 people that were responsible um, and show proof. Look at what the Hush Puppy case has shown. They followed the money, they, followed, they investigated, they had traces, phone calls, um, WhatsApp messages, so much evidence that shows that, you know, these persons are guilty of the crimes that they are being accused of. Nothing like that in 10 years of fighting insurgency. So, I don't think we're, we're, we're serious as a country. I think we're joking around with the lives of Nigerian people and, you know, until we begin to get serious, we'll continue to see these deaths and kidnappings every other day. Okay, our final top trending story is about sympathy strike. We know that when one union or body is striking, protesting over something, and another union, you know, goes on uh, to protest or strike in support of that. And that seems to be what the River State Government says is happening in their state. We know that NARCH, the Association of Resident Doctors, had, you know, embarked on a strike April 1st. They called that off and, you know, went on a strike again August 2nd, Monday, saying that the government had, you know, been paying resident doctors irregularly. You know, just went on to give a whole, a whole list of challenges, you know, especially um, with the failure of the government to fulfill the memorandum of action that they had signed that made them call off that strike. So in River State, the governor, this is a statement we have here um, released yesterday by Tammy Danagogo. He's a secretary to the state government, SSG. He said that the residents of um, the resident doctors of River State are paid regularly by the state and that they have no right to go on a sympathy strike with other doctors. They went on to say that this strike action should be only applicable to doctors, resident doctors who are under the payroll of the federal government. They're saying this doesn't affect you because we pay your salaries as at when do so it, the question then becomes what then is the legality of a sympathy strike and actually does the river state government pay resident doctors like they say so but if indeed they pay resident doctors you know still goes back to the first question um do they really have to show solidarity 
for their own, you know, other members of their union. It, it still is a lot because when I spoke to the ARD um, president in Luth yesterday, he mentioned that, you know, that members of NAD are going on a compliance and monitoring TM uh, visit around all, you know, hospitals, and that doctors who do not comply with the strike, doctors who sit that out, would be penalized, they will be fined, and that they will be blacklisted as saboteurs. So it really seems to be a dicey situation. Do you protest or do you strike in solidarity with your um, colleagues or do you risk losing your job? Um, the, the River State government seems to have a point, you know, with the fact that they claim to be paying salaries regularly. And so, you know, why do you want to punish indigents of the state, you know, by going on strike along with those who are not being paid salaries? But I think they also need to understand, uh, Governor Wiki rather needs to understand that um, you know, it's pretty much the same as, you know, saying that, oh, you know, if anyone dies in Benue of a terrorist attack, then people in Edo State shouldn't bother, you know, complaining because, well, nobody's dying here, so why should you complain? Um, uh, you know, th there is, you know, a, a fault with that. And I believe that the, the doctors have a union, and if they feel like there's, there's a couple of states that they mentioned, I just can't, you know, uh, remember them now, that have been owing for nine months, for 12 months, for six months, you know, um, um, you know and haven't paid resident doctors. And so I feel it's a, it's a thing that every resident doctor needs to, you know, has decided rather that they are going to, you know, campaign against, they're going to strike against. Every single doctor across the country needs to be paid regularly, needs to have an increased hazard allowance, need to have um, better COVID, um, um, uh, um, well, financing, you know, and, and payment. Um, and so they cannot single out just the states where uh, they are not being paid properly. They cannot also say, okay, just federal government doctors, you know, would not work and, you know, the state government workers, you know, will go back to work. It, I don't think it works like that. I understand, you know, where Governor Wiki is coming from and, you know, I, I would, you know, maybe also, um, you know, well, I understand basically. Um, but I don't think it works like that. You know, you can't, you can't, it's pretty much same with ASU, you know, and then when they, they were having issues with lecturers, you know, and some lecturers went ahead to sign with the IPPIS and others said, no, they're going to stay with UTAS and going to continue with the strike. You know, they also had challenges then, saying that they, it seemed like some lecturers were backstabbing them. It's also sometimes when you hear that ASU is going to strike and then some universities will say, oh, we're not going to be part of this ASU strike. We don't care about whatever it is you're complaining about. Uh, this university is going to keep on running. It feels like back backstabbing the union. And so um, I hope, you know, that if they all go on strike, you know, it gets the federal government and the state governments to understand the concerns that every single, you know, doctor is uh, sharing here and encourages them or, you know, convinces them to, um, you know, have those conversations with the federal government, have those conversations with whoever it is that is necessary to ensure that their, you know, uh, finances are, you know, uh, uh, done better and they, you know, get what they feel like they deserve. Um, I, I personally don't like, you know, threatening striking workers with, with SAC um, because, you know, we simply address the, the concerns that, you know, they've put out. It's not greed here. You know, they have simple concerns that need to be addressed and they're doctors. Come on. I saw, I saw um, can't remember who said it, you know, that how do you pay doctors 5,000 hour hazard allowance when House of Assembly members are receiving, you know, hazard allowance in millions? Make it make sense, you know, that National Assembly members will be receiving hazard allowance, you know, in millions of naira. What hazard? are they really dealing with in the National Assembly? Can anybody share with me one National Assembly member that as a result of doing his duty, of going to work every day, you know, collapsed or something? Would you know, in what way is the National Assembly member at risk doing his job? They have security details, they have drivers, they have policemen who are attached to them. What exactly is that hazard that you, that you know, you would make you pay, you know, a uh, National Assembly member millions of Naira as hazard allowance? And then compare it to a doctor who has to go face to face with patients every single day, who risks getting infected with various diseases every day, you know, in the course of their duty, who has to work tireless hours to ensure that patients get the medical services and, um, you know, response that, they, that is needed. We're still very, very, you know, far behind with regards to our healthcare system. And so, um, you know, they, they, I believe, you know, that they have good reasons for wanting to go on strike and they should be listened to. And it's unfair, you know, that you sign a memorandum of action, a hundred days passes, you don't implement any of these, you know, um, uh, agreements and, you know, you, you, you act like you don't know why they're going on strike. I think it's unfair, but um, Governor Wiki needs to also understand that part, um, that you, you, A can't go on strike and B says, oh, I don't care because I'm receiving salary. I don't care about A not receiving salary.
All right, uh, big stories on the newspapers today. We'll be taking a look at them after the break.